Hey kids, it's Mr Fly here, hope you're well. And welcome to another edition of Bike News. Another month, another Prime Minister, eh? What a few weeks it's been, if you follow politics here in the UK. Incredible. Anyway, let's not get into that. What I have got, though, is uh, four copies of MCN to go through. So if you're interested in what's been going on in the world of motorcycles here in the UK for the last month, stick around and stay tuned. Okay, so welcome back to another edition of Bike News. Four papers to get through uh, this time. Grab yourself a brew, this may go on for a little while. First story that I picked out here, which is interesting uh, given the political situation in the UK. Don't hold your breath for a UK autobahn. So this one I marked up before uh, events kind of overtook, so I'll read it anyway. But Prime Minister Liz Truss, yeah right, has mooted the possibility of scrapping the mandatory motorway speed limit of 70 miles an hour, instead letting drivers decide a safe speed for themselves. Can you imagine, of all the, uh, of all the policies? Anyway, Motorcycle Action Group's Colin Brown explains, uh, HGVs already have a lower 60 mile an hour limit on motorways, so there is precedent for lighter vehicles to enjoy higher speed limits, which is a good point, I hadn't thought of it that way. He added, I would be surprised though if off the cuff comments made in a leadership race progress to concrete proposals any time soon. Well, stranger things have happened, Colin. Anyway, an 80 mile an hour limit would bring the UK in line with other European countries, including Austria, Italy, France, and Denmark. I have to say, actually, I do think an 80 mile an hour limit on UK motorways would be a good move. 70 seems to me to be a bit slow this day and age. Those speed limits came in, didn't they, at a time when cars could barely do 70 miles an hour. So uh, yeah, I think increasing it to 80 would be a good thing. We know that um, motorways are the safest of all forms of roads that we've got. Less accidents happen on motorways than any other roads. So uh, why not when cars are so capable and bikes these days? Let's do it, I say. Interested to hear your views on that. I guess there might be an, em an emissions argument by the, uh, by the Gretas and so on, but anyway. Right. Next story then, uh, one that's uh, still relevant. Mash hit the mud. French firm reveal long-legged trail version of their thumping retro roadster. Now what do you think of this? Take a look at this little beauty. I think this looks really cool. I've always been a fan of the way that Mash bikes look, but I've never ever ridden one. I don't even know where my local dealer is. They're a French manufacturer, I think. When I've ever seen them at shows and stuff, I've always been impressed by the looks of them and thought, oh, I'd love a go on one of those, but never managed to do it. So Mash, if you're watching, can we have a go somehow? I don't know how we can sort it out, but if we could, that would be good. Anyway, what's this one all about? Out. French firm Mash Motors, it was French, have uh, released a trial version of their single cylinder X Ride 650 Classic, or maybe it's Cross Ride 650 Classic, uh, offering off road credentials and retro styling at a bargain basement cost. I like the sound of this. It's 600, and, oh, it, sorry, it's powered by the same 647cc air cooled single uh, taken from the Classic and it produces a claimed 40 brake horsepower. So, uh, pretty pokey. Uh, 21 inch front and 18 inch rear spoked wheel. So, that uh, sounds like it's, you know, obviously it's got off road, proper off road credentials. ABS prevents unwanted lock ups with a four pot. Uh, front caliper supplying the stopping power so it sounds like it's got reasonable brakes on the front wonder if you can disable the ABS because if you are going to do some green lanes and stuff you don't necessarily want ABS kicking in do you uh, blacked out engine and gold anodized wheels I love the wheels on this I love a gold wheel me giving it a look of quality far beyond the expected 5599 price so 5,600 quid for one of these. Uh, so it puts it up against Royal Enfield's uh, Scram 411, which is about a grand less actually, but I do think this looks much nicer than the Royal Enfield. Of course, don't know how it rides. The MASH trail will be available in dealers next month. Well, I've no idea where my nearest MASH dealer is. I suppose I should have looked it up on the interweb before I started this video, but uh, it looks really cool to me. I don't think I've ever actually seen one on the road either, so I don't suppose they're, you know, any mash, not just this one. So I don't suppose they sell in huge numbers, but uh, yeah, if you've got a mash, I'll be interested in how you've got on with it. Is it a good bike? I certainly like the look of this one. I think it looks brilliant. And at that price, maybe worth considering if you fancy an alternative to something like a CRF, uh, which, you know, if you want to do a bit of green laning, great way to get into it and, and not a lot of money either to commit to it. All right, next story here, Fight Club. Which is Ducati's finest naked street bruiser, the Street Fighter V2 or the V4S? I love these bikes. Uh, when they first came out, the V4S, I, I thought it was a, a hideous abomination. I thought they'd taken a Panigale and ruined it. But then I borrowed one and I was absolutely smitten. The V4 is a beautiful, beautiful bike. I also um, borrowed the V2. I'll try and, if I remember, put some links in the corner to my reviews of these bikes. And uh, although the V2 looks very much like its bigger brother, I didn't think it rode anywhere near as well. It reminded me much more of uh, my 899 Panigale. Of course, it's got an engine on it that is derived from that. Uh, so I didn't like it anywhere near as much as the V4. Now, I'm not a particularly fast rider. As if you watch my videos, you'll probably know I'm a bit of a rubbish rider. But I found the V4 a pussycat to ride slowly. And if you did want to wind it up, the thing absolutely flew. I thought it was an amazing machine. But 
is 21 and a half grand and the V2 is 15 grand. Uh, and I've always been uh, an exponent of uh, when Ducati do these things, when they make a smaller uh, sibling of their bikes, which they often do, I often think the smaller one is better. Uh, ergo, why well, I've got an 899 and why well, I didn't buy the what was then the 1199 because I thought the 899 would be the better bike for the road, as it proved to be. Anyway, let's see what um, what MCN said. And this is uh, it's Neavesy, my favourite road tester from MCN, Michael Neves. He says, you're in for a wild ride. Neither are cheap, but they're both full-blooded, booming Ducatis with beautiful paintwork and lots of clever tech. It's hard not to be swayed by the Street Fighter V4S if cost isn't an issue. The Street Fighter V2 is anything but the poor relation though. It makes more sense than the V4S in the real world and it costs over six grand less. So yeah, I'm a little bit surprised at that. They've given the, uh, or Neves has given the V4 four out of five and the V2 five out of five. Now normally I, I would kind of agree with that, but in this case I actually disagree with Neves on this one. Let's face it, he's a better rider. He knows what he's talking about more than I do. But uh, I thought the V4 was a much nicer ride than the V2. But it is six grand more. So, you know, that's got to be a kind of, that's a dream, money, no object, lottery win type situation. But uh, both great bikes. I'm kind of, you know, we're nitpicking here. You wouldn't be unhappy with either of them. And, I th and the more I see them, the more I think they look good. It's incredible how your taste changes over time, isn't it? I first, you know, as I said, when I first saw them, I thought they were horrible. Now I think they're lovely. What is going on there? Right, moving on, excess all areas. Does the MT-10 SP still cut the mustard and is it worth an extra two and a half over the stocker? So here we are, this is the new for this year MT-10 SP. Uh, when I say new, it's been upgraded and updated along with its non-SP brother. Uh, most notably, well, some electronics upgrades, I think, and then the front end has been restyled. Now I really like, when the MT-10, actually this is interesting, because when I think back to it, when the MT-10 first came out and we saw it at the NEC show, they had that uh, the standard bike in that sort of Airfix grey with the yellow wheels, uh, and I thought it looked unusual. I wasn't smitten by it until I saw it, and then I thought it looked absolutely great. And then I rode the SP a few years back. Again, if I can find that review, I'll put a link in the corner. And I absolutely loved that bike, and it became one of my favourite naked um, roses, and it still is. Uh, I still kind of have a little. If I, you know, if I had space in the garage, I'd have an I'd have an MT10. I think they're a lovely a lovely bike. But I'm not sure about the styling of this new one. That said, I've never seen one in the flesh, so I could be talking rubbish, and I reserve the right to change my mind once again, but I prefer the look of the old bike. Anyway, let's see what it says here. Uh, Build as the ultimate MT, the SP was launched a year after the stock bike and came with upgrades including semi-active Olin suspension with both MT10 models updated for 2022 through a new electronics package that includes an IMU, revised engine and new styling, but is the SP still top dog? Right, the, re the John Harry says here, the base and SP models feature the same updates, making the gap between them appear pretty small, and therefore the two and a half grand difference harder to justify. I guess it's in the suspension. The semi-active Olins delivers a far more assured ride than the KYB kit on the base bike. Uh, is it enough to excuse blowing two and a half more on the SP? I'd say it is. So John Uri thinks it is worth it, mainly for that suspension, and we all know Olin suspension is amazing. I don't think I'm necessarily a good enough rider to notice the difference. Um, but, uh, although of course bragging rights is always the thing, isn't it? But two and a half grand for that, it's quite a lot of money in it. But uh, I think the standard SP is well worth investigating if you like the look of this bike. I think it's an absolute corker. Uh, looking forward to uh, yeah having a ride on one of these. I must organize that. So uh, once we're through my current um, tour series, I'll see if I can get hold of a Yamaha um, MT10 and uh, do a bit of an update review, a revisited review on it, because it's been a few years since I rode that original one, and I was pretty smitten by it then. Alrighty, next paper. Right, first story in here, back with a buzz. Oh, very clever headline, I see what you've done there, MCN, nice one. Honda's legendary Hornet name returns in a new 750 parallel twin. Now there's a, and there's the first issue, isn't it? I, the old Hornet was a bit of a, became a bit of a cult bike, and it was around at the time when I was learning to ride, uh, about 2012. And in fact, I think my um, riding instructor had a um, had a Hornet. So I, I have great affection for these bikes, as did a lot of people. Uh, and when I heard that a new Honda Hornet was coming out, I was quite excited by it until I heard it was going to be a parallel twin. Now don't get me wrong, I like a parallel twin in certain applications. I've got one in my um, Triumph Speed Twin. A retro bike, I think it fits that sort of genre. Of course, I've got a, a twin in my BMW GS, albeit not a parallel twin. So I do appreciate twins and I do like them. But in the Hornet, I think part of its appeal of the, the old bike was the fact that it was a four-cylinder machine. And if this had been a 754, I think that would have been an absolute 
hoot. Now, this might be brilliant too. I've not ridden one, so again, I reserve the right to change my mind if and when I get to ride one of these Hornets. But let's read what it says here. Honda have finally revealed uh, their all-new CB750 Hornet, which looks set to take over the fight directly to the ever-popular Yamaha MT-07. Uh, which I guess is you know, obviously the one they're targeting, and I think I'm right in saying that's a, that's a parallel twin as well, isn't it? This modern naked uses a brand new 270 degree parallel twin, producing a claimed 90.6 brake horsepower, so plenty of power there. Uh, standard features include three riding modes, courtesy of a ride-by-wire throttle, rain, standard and sport, plus three-stage engine braking and traction control. Cool. Uh, you even get wheelie control, which sounds a bit over the top, doesn't it, for uh, a... 755cc parallel twin. Anyway, it's there. Uh, it's got a five inch color TFT dash that can be connected to your mobile. What a blow. These things that connect to your mobile, I'll, I'll be glad when bike manufacturers stop doing this and give us native sat navs and so on. I just think it's a pain in the backside, the whole mobile connection thing. Full LED lighting plus auto cancelling indicators which flash under hard braking. That's a nice little touch. Um, there we go. So yeah, it looks I think it looks quite nice. I like the styling. I'm a little bit disappointed that it's a parallel twin. I'll, I, I ought to just, you know, give it the benefit of the doubt because it sounds like it's well equipped. And um, the price here, just a, a pound under seven thousand pounds, so competitively priced. Seven nine five mil seat height, so quite low. Um, One hundred ninety kilograms. Not sure if that's wet or dry. So medium weight, I think, uh, and I like it with the with the red frame as well. So anyway, interested to know in the comments below what you think of the new Honda Hornet. Have they missed a trick by making it a parallel twin? Well, now am I being a bit harsh uh, on it uh, for saying it should have been a four-cylinder model? All right, moving on. Next one here. Oh, crikey. Oh, I'm on a bit of a whingy mood here. Premium Bond's new speed triple RR celebrates 60 years of 007. Here we go again. Triumph doing that thing, which I just think is just a little bit childish. Coming up with a limited edition model, uh, stamping some other branding all over it and, and charging a fortune for it. Let's see what they've done here. Triumph are celebrating 60 years of James Bond movies with a limited edition version of their half-fared speed triple 1200 RR. Priced at £21,995, limited to 60 units worldwide, the special is dressed in a black colour scheme, complete with all 25 James Bond film titles on the tank. Really? Uh, you'll also get 007 graphics and hand-painted gold lining. Well, I'm all for a bit of hand-painted gold lining, but you can keep the 007 graphics, I think, and as for having the, the names of all the films all over the tank, not for me. Now, maybe if you're a massive James Bond fan, this would be, and very rich, this would be something you might put in your collection. But as a normal everyday biker, does this appeal to you? I've, I've whinged about these before. They do these hookups, don't they, with you know, watch manufacturers and all sorts of done other 007 bikes. And the, uh, given there's only 60 made, I'm sure there's probably 60 people in the world that do want these enough. Uh, and they, they may even well be sold out. I've got a feeling they might be sold out already. But uh, yeah, not for me, that one. Uh, what do you think? Do you want more of these um, brand tie-ups that Triumph do? Or have we seen enough of those? Let me know again in the comments below. Right, is that the whinging over? Let's hope so. Right, next up, Bologna's Globe Trotter. Here we go. This is the this is quite exciting actually. This is the new Ducati V4S Rally or V4 Rally. Let me read what it says first, and then we'll have a chat. Uh, Ducati are deploying clever new tech to help people ride further in comfort on the new Multistrada V4 Rally, and that includes kit that can shut down the rear cylinders while you're on the move. Very clever stuff. Working across all modes, the extended deactivation system sees the rear cylinder mount of the V4 motor switch off at idle when stationary. Well, the standard bike does that already. But it can also shut down on the go, with the cylinders firing back into life when speeds increase or when the rider demands more power. Clever stuff. I assume that's to do with um, maybe fuel economy, because let's face it, the old V4 uh, multi is a bit thirsty and or emissions, I don't know. It's a production bike first. Oh, and the idea is to cut emissions and boost range. So there we go, it's exactly that. There's a new screen which has grown 40 mil in height, always handy, a bit extra um, wind protection. The tail of the bike has been stretched, moving the luggage backwards for more pillion legroom. That's interesting. As it happens, Mrs. Flyer was riding pillion on one of these at the weekend. Uh, last weekend, we went away to Wales. If you follow me on Instagram or Facebook, you will have seen a few pics of us and some mates blatting around Wales in the rain. Uh, we took the gold wing and it was, it was an absolute hoot. We had a lot of fun. But for a period of time, uh, my missus went on my mate Ian's uh, Ducati Multistrada. He's got the standard V4S. And she said, although she found it comfortable, she did feel a little bit more cramped than on the on the GS. So a bit more legroom 
will, will wouldn't go amiss. I think if you're uh, interested in riding a Multistrada with a pillion, this may be one worth considering. Uh, the other thing it says here: there are adjustable seat heights for the front and back, plus lower suspension options, and it has a new Easy Lift feature, which opens the suspension hydraulics to help you lift it off the side stand. This is great stuff. And also, I think they did an update, didn't they? They did that electronic update on all the Multistradas. I assume it. Uh, applies to this one as well where when you stop uh, I think you can set it the suspension so it's on its lowest setting until you get to a certain speed and then, then it'll rise up uh, which again all these things that just make life easier to handle large bikes just it's just a good thing isn't it so so thumbs up to Ducati for coming up with uh, with those changes it's an awesome looking bike it's an amazing machine isn't it in the adventure bike world for me there are only two bikes that's the GS and the uh, Multistrada V4 uh, and this one looks really lovely so uh, well done Ducati again interested to think or see if you agree or disagree with me in the comments below Right, last one for this paper, Suzuki Expand Commuter Fleet with new 125cc scooter, new Bergman hits the streets. So, uh, I'm a bit of a scooter fan. I know that there's, in this country, for some reason, we don't really do scooters or get them. Uh, and they are very much a tool for commuting. I understand that in other, maybe warmer countries, for example, in Italy, where you see a lot of these things, the weather's a bit more conducive to having a scooter. But if you live in a town or in an urban environment and you just need practical transport, you cannot beat a scooter. And 125s are brilliant if you're in traffic because you don't need the speed. The practicality of them, storage space under the seat, um, they're comfortable, they're just brilliant. I love scooters, cheap to run as well. Let's see what it says about the new Suzuki. The new Bergman joins the Aven Avenis, Avenis 125 and Address 125 and looks set to challenge Honda's PCX 125 for a share of the sales in the buoyant low capacity scooter market. Now I rode the PCX 125 a couple of months back. Again, I'll put a link in the corner uh, to that one. Absolutely love that little bike. It's Britain's best selling motorcycle, so, um, or powered two wheel. I should say. So no wonder um, Suzuki want a bit of that action. Uh, what else does it say? 112 kilogram mass, so very lightweight. Uh, returns are claimed 148.67 miles per gallon. So in these days of high fuel prices, that's very tempting, isn't it? If you want some urban transport, 150 miles per gallon, that is incredible. Uh, efficiency is boosted further by stop-start technology, which is a first for a Suzuki model and reduces the amount of time the engine is spent idling. I love that feature. I've actually got that on my Goldwing, which some say is like a big scooter. Um, and I think it's brilliant. You come to a halt, engine stops, some cars do this, and it starts as soon as you give it some throttle again. I love that. I do sometimes wonder what impact it's gonna have on your starter motor, but presumably bikes and cars that have that feature have a starter motor and battery uh, with you know that's designed with that in mind. At least I hope they do, because it does, again, from a mechanical sympathy point of view, I do wonder whether it's a good idea to keep stop starting your engine like that. But I'm sure the boffins at uh, Suzuki have thought of that. Anyway, it, it is great in practice, regardless of what, whether it's uh, good mechanically or not. It must be good. Uh, when the dinky fuel injected 32 and a half kilogram engine fires back into life, you're likely not to notice thanks to a silent start system. Uh, said to get the bike going smoothly and quietly to improve refinement. I like the sound of this. Uh, it's got LED lighting, 21 and a half litres of storage underneath the seat, which is just brilliant, and an LCD dash. How much is it though? Does it say here? Can't see the price of it anywhere, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, it looks it looks great. It looks very much like the PCX125, actually. Um, yeah, maybe I'll see if I can have a little go on that one at some point. I do love a scooter, me. Um, just, uh, just fantastic, and I don't know why in this country we get so snooty about it. I love anything with two wheels. Uh, okay, it's not a bike that you're going to ride as an enthusiast on a Sunday, but if you do want some cheap transport around town, you cannot beat a scooter and these still make more sense than an electric bike in many ways alrighty that's it for paper number two moving on then to the next paper carbon clad corner carver what an absolute beauty this looks or at least to my eye it does it's the new uh, BMW M1000RR it says here uh, BMW sets sights on 2023 world superbike season with latest M1000RR draped in aero upgrades I think it looks absolutely amazing this uh, completely wasted on somebody like me but I do like the looks of it says here, uh, BMW have upgraded the fared M1000RR with advanced aerodynamics claimed to boost speed and stability, featuring a stronger, more tunable 209.2 brake horsepower four-cylinder engine complete with forged pistons, CNC machined intake ports, shift cam valve timing and more. BMW invested heavily in aerodynamics said to boost top speeds from 190 to 195 miles an hour. So if you want an extra five miles an hour on top of your 190, this is the bike to have. Um, other features include a choice of carbon or forged rims, plus an M endurance seat uh, designed to give a larger contact area when hanging off for greater feedback and comfort. It'll <laughs> comfort, yeah. It'll uh, set you back thirty thousand nine hundred and forty pounds, thirty-one grand for one of these, which is a lot of money, and of course, not many people are going to buy them. But thirty-one grand for something with that level of tech. And let's face it, the standard uh, S one thousand RR is just a beautiful sports bike, probably my favourite overall sports bike. 
Um, an incredible bit of kit. It looks incredible. Um, what a beast. What a beast that is. What do you think of it? But uh, I mean, it, the aero and stuff would all be wasted on me, but it is a lovely thing, isn't it? There we are, 31 grand for a sports bike. Okie dokie. Oh, Norton. Uh, do you remember we mentioned the, uh, I think in the last bike news, we talked about these Atlas models weren't going to be pursued. And I think Norton has come back now with a bit of a bit of comment. So Norton Chief Commercial Officer Christian Gladwell has told MCN that their promising Atlas 650 range was shelved in order to focus on future electric models. Now, how disappointing a statement is that? Unbelievable. I, I, I mean, I love the looks of these Atlas models and I get if Norton, new Norton, can't produce them for some reason or don't want to or, and are going to come up with something else, that's fine. But to shelve what would have been, I think, something with great mass market appeal for to focus on future electric models, that's just, well, to me, that's just not Norton. It's, it's very disappointing. Uh, but there we go. What else does he say? It was tough, he said, but if we wanted to invest in that little 650 twin, that would mean diverting resource, money, time and people onto that. Whereas the writing's on the wall for combustion. Yes, but not for a little while, is it? And my goodness me, I think uh, they could have really scooped up and made, you know, suddenly turned Norton into a mass market popular uh, motorcycle company. So they're saying they can only focus on one thing at a time, and what that is is electricity. Well, I sort of, I, I sort of get that, but it's really disappointing for me. We're not looking to make an electric motorcycle, he says. We're looking to make a completely new experience with electric transportation. Isn't that what Clive Sinclair said? Um, well, let's hope they make uh, let's hope they make a better go of it than uh, Sinclair did with their C5. Um, it was the C5, wasn't it? Because or is that my helmet? Anyway, uh, what a shame. What do you think to that? I, I still I still lament the loss of these atlases. I wonder what happened to these these um, prototypes that we saw. I think they look great bikes. I I never believed that Norton would be able to knock them out at reasonable prices, um, and maybe New Norton can't either, and that's partly why they've gone. But uh, anyway, there we go. We ain't gonna see anything like that from New Norton. We're gonna see an electric transportation experience instead would be do that's a shame i wish norton the best of luck i would love uh, norton to do well but i'm not i'm just not sure about that what do you think am i being harsh right budget retro to big adventures so it says budget route to big adventures that makes more sense doesn't it uh, vogue take aim at honda cr300 rally with bargain single now check this out it looks quite nice doesn't it again i love the little yellow bits on the wheels i think that looks cool that appeals to me in my i'm just a bit of a tart when it comes to things like that i think that looks fantastic chinese brand that's where the, the immediately i know people are going to be anti it because it's chinese but i say don't diss it just because of that. Chinese brand Vogue have a new A2 license compliant single set to take on Honda's 6,449 CRF300 rally in the low capacity trailer market. It's called the Rally 300. It's got a 292cc four valve uh, engine putting out 28.2 brake horsepower at 9,000 RPM. So it's 1.2 bhp more powerful than the Honda. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're only talking about 28 brake horsepower, 1.2 you know reasonable you're probably gonna, not going to notice it but hey ho it's up there with the honda anyway uh, the rally weighs in at a claimed 158 kilograms ready to ride with a top speed of 77.8 miles an hour those figures sound all right for a bike of this type uh, the price the 300 rally will retail in germany in a choice of two colors for 4229 euros which is about 3,682 pounds. Sounds like there's no plans to bring it here at the moment. It says here, previous importer Lexmoto do not currently have a deal with the factory, but the bike meets the regs, so there's nothing to stop another firm stepping in. So maybe we won't see it here for a little while, but if uh, if we if it does get an importer, then that's a, a viable option, isn't it? 3,682 quid. It's in that ballpark. If you just want, again, just want to do a bit of green laning, there's an alternative to that uh, mash that we saw at the start. Nice one. I like the look of that. Okay. All right, another Norton story. I do wish Norton uh, the best of luck because this is a bike that, to me, looks like a Norton should do. This is the Norton Commando. Commando is reborn. Uh, New Norton have done a lot of work on the old bike and made this up the quality, changed lots of parts, and now it becomes, uh, you know, a, a really nice motorcycle. I think on paper it doesn't sound that good, but uh, I just think this has all the elements that, that are what appeal what makes Norton appeal to people like me, enthusiasts, you know, a proper engine, it looks like a proper motorcycle, and it's got that name on the side of the tank. I'll take this over an electric Norton any day of the week, well, at least for the next 10 years anyway. So what does it say here? Uh, Norton have launched a re-engineered Commando. Does the latest version make the name desirable once again? Um, it's a motorcycle, not an iPad. I like that headline. Unlike rival retro machines from Triumph and Moto Guzzi, which feature modes, traction control, connectivity and more, the Commando keeps things old school. I like that. Um, black and gold, there are two versions of the Commando. The SP, which, uh, which stands for Sport, is 
$19.99 with that bright handlebars and the cafe racer the cr is 16 at 9.99 so they are expensive for bikes that don't have you know traction control connectivity and all that sort of thing but that's not why you buy a norton i mean it is an enthusiastic an enthusiast bike i think we've already established that different in a good way says mike armitage have the changes worked well yes the Commando experience is now what you expect of a traditional British parallel twin, but without all the niggles and worries that came with the previous version. Whether it's worth the best bit of 17 grand depends on your perspective. Yeah, I agree, it is expensive for what it is, but if you're an enthusiast with plenty of cash, it does appeal to me, I must say. Uh, the Norton gives a genuine sense of connection to its ancestors with its handmade frame, anodized aluminum yokes, and hand-polished exhaust. The Commando is different, and different in a good way. I, I love the looks of this. I'd love to have a go on one. Unfortunately, I missed out on the... Uh, on the launch of this um i did leave a little message on i think it was on instagram saying uh, i'd love a go on one and they said i could get a test drive at my local dealer whenever i wished which was <laughs> i thought was quite funny anyway i don't know why i think that's funny i don't mean to think that i should get any special treatment from norton but i do know of course the guys up at crazy horse they're norton dealers i'm sure when they get them available i could go and ride one there but uh, yeah what a lovely looking uh, bit of kit that is what do you think do you think it's worth 17 grand what Without riding it, it's, obviously you can't say, but it just ticks all the boxes for me. I love the look of the of the dials on it. I love the look of the engine on it. I love the fact it says Norton on the side. But then again, if you're being practical, you know all those things. You could say the same about the Royal Enfield 650 Interceptor, couldn't you? And that's like a third of the price. So there we go. Anyway, so there we go. That's that. That's the third paper. Final paper. Just three stories to pick out from this one. Stats show biking is getting safer. Now, this is a good news story. How riding aids have improved kit are saving bikers' lives. Motorcycle fatalities have fallen to the lowest number in 10 years outside of lockdown hit 2020, apparently. Uh, new statistics from the DFT, Department for Transport, show 322 riders lost their lives in collisions involving another vehicle during 2021. The only year that was lower than that was 2020, with 299. Of course, we weren't riding them because of all the lockdowns. Tony Campbell, CEO of the Motorcycle Industry Association, says it's encouraging to see the significant decline in motorcycle-related fatalities. It sure is. Uh, he said that they believe there are several reasons behind the improvement that include steps forward with protective kit and electronics, which are making bikes both safer and easier to ride. In addition, he believes the greater number of bikes, e-scooters and bikers on the roads are causing drivers to be more on the alert. Interesting. I hope that's the case, but great news, whatever, that dirt bikes, or at least the statistics are showing, we're having fewer fatal accidents. So uh, keep careful out there, keep vigilant, but uh, it's going in the right direction. That's a great, that's a great story. Right, this is a cheeky uh, tactic from John Ari. I quite like this. Save cash, buy the old colours. Uh, John here says, it seems like every morning I'm greeted by an email announcing a hot new 2023 bike model, but things aren't quite what they seem because an increasing number of brands, Kawasaki and Honda being the main culprits, just class a fresh paint job as defining a new model. And I, I completely get what you mean here, John. Uh, I, I'm, of course, a Goldwing fan, and um, I see that um, Honda brought out a 2023 Goldwing now. It's identical to the 2022, except you can get it in silver now, whereas it was in blue last year. Uh, things like that. It, I suppose it is a bit of a cheeky tactic. Of course, they're not they're not new models. It's just new colour schemes. And, and uh, I suppose there are some people that always have to have the, the latest and greatest and maybe would would upgrade their bike just to get a new colour. I don't know. Would you do that? Again, stick uh, stick a comment below and let me know. I'm not sure I'd upgrade just for a colour, but um, I suppose as well as maybe there's good if you want to, if you want to bask in the glow that you've got the latest and greatest and it's only in that particular colour. Maybe there's something in that, I don't know. But I find it a bit of a cheeky tactic. He says, so if like me, you don't care too much about a lick of paint, look for the new 2022 models that are unchanged for 2023, the gold wing being one, and save a few quid, especially if they are pre-registered. Yeah, there will be, particularly this time of year, I guess, as the new bikes are coming out, bike shows, all that sort of thing. Not that there are that many this year, it has to be said. Um, then, uh, yeah, go and find some new old stock uh, in the 2022 colours, you'll get yourself a bargain. All right, last story before we get on to parish notices. Excess baggage. Which BMW is best at smashing out miles? The R1250RT or the K1600 GTL? Now, this is a story that uh, piqued my interest because I've got, I think it might even be this very K1600 GTL in my garage at the moment. Uh, BMW have lent it to me for a couple of weeks uh, to get to know uh, because it's been revamped uh, this year. Um, and, of course, it's, a, it's an obvious competitor to the Goldwing, which I know well. So I've got that. It might even be this very bike because it's the same colour and it's the same GTL LE. So it, it may be the same press bike that I've actually got. Uh, and they put and MCN have pitted it against the R1250RT. So the um, K1600 is starts at 23623. The uh, RT is 20. 
0.015. So it sounds like there's three and a half grand difference. In reality, that's not necessarily the case because you know what BMW like, as are other manufacturers, once you spec these bikes up, the prices go up. I spec'd up a GTL LE uh, to the way that I wanted it recently. It came out nearer 25 and a half. So suddenly that gap gets bigger. Anyway, let's see what uh, MCN said. And it's Nevesy again. He says, BMW know how to do it. On paper, the K1600 GTL looks hard to beat, but its extra kilos can dampen the joy of riding and it can be hard to manage at low speed. But the RT is still a king of the Taurus. Its engine internals don't spin in double cream. I love that use of words. Not the Ks, but it's still beautifully smooth. Of course, you've got the boxer engine twin on the RT versus the amazing six cylinder inline six, an incredible engine on the GTL. Um, which is super silky smooth. Um, it's the RT, Nevesy said, is even more comfortable, has quieter aerodynamics, is more frugal, and being so much lighter and more agile is a lot sportier. So that's uh, that's interesting, isn't it? It's given the RT five stars and the GT, or the K1600 GTL, sorry, four stars. Interesting. I think the K1600 looks a much nicer bike. I've always found the RT particularly the new one, a little bit bulbous at the front end, but it does ride beautifully, that's for sure. I'm not gonna say whether I agree or disagree with this, because you'll have to wait for my review of the uh, GTL LE coming soon. Alrighty, that's it for the paper review, so moving on to... Parish notices, just a quickie this time round for this month. So uh, first off, must say thanks to those of you that have stuck with my Alaska and Canada tour. Lots of episodes of that already been put up on the channel. Lots more to come. Now I know what these tours are like. You start off often getting big views and then they then they tail off. This one is no different. But take it from me, I would say this, wouldn't I? But the episodes on the Alaska and Canada tour get better as they go on. Number one, I get better at making the videos, I think. And number two, uh, more stuff happens. Uh, necessarily in those early days uh, when you're in Alaska and the Yukon, the distances are massively huge between places and there's not much there other than amazing scenery. So uh, those first episodes may have put you off. Don't let them put you off. I uh, encourage you to have another go uh, if you haven't looked at those tours recently. Uh, and in the next few weeks, there's going to be another seven episodes of those coming along, certainly in the next month between now and the next Bike News. So thanks for watching those and uh, do give them another go if you thought they're not for you because it's just long straight roads with one turn. It does change. There's lots of exciting things coming, including bears, helicopters, all sorts of stuff. So do keep watching those. And thanks for those of you and for all the kind comments uh, that you've given me on those. So what have we got coming up then on the channel? On the 26th of November, before the next bike news, uh, I will be putting up a uh, another classic review. This time I've been riding the Triumph Sprint ST, a motorcycle that actually reignited my interest in motorbikes. I used to ride bikes when I was a teenager, you know, fizzies, that sort of thing. And then my parents and my wife wouldn't let me have a bike, blah, blah, blah. And that's how come I didn't ride again until 2012, I think I mentioned that earlier, um, and when I got my full license. Um, but the reason why I got that full license is because I saw a Triumph Sprint ST, a brand new one, and got chatting to the owner and was smitten by the bike. Anyway, that review and more details on that is coming up on the 26th of November. Absolutely love that bike, so stick around, stay tuned for that one. And then after that will be um, my next bike news. And then in between now and then, a load more episodes of the tour. So, uh, so that's what's gonna happen. Uh, seven more episodes of the tour, then the review, then bike news, then we're back into, I think then we're probably back into normal service resumes with a mix of with a mix of content. Again, really interested to hear your views in the comments below as to whether you like the fact that I've run the tours consecutively or not. Uh, I don't normally do it that way. Usually I mix and match. And I used to get comments from people saying, well, can't you run the one after the other? It's easier to keep up with it. And I agree with that, but uh, I'm not sure whether that's gonna work out well in terms of my channel, just thinking of YouTube algorithms and that sort of thing, because, um, as the views go down, YouTube presents future videos to less and less people, so it may damage my channel to do it that way. I don't know, we'll see, we'll see. Anyway, interested in your views on that below, let me know. Uh, and uh, the only other thing, again, I want to say was just a huge thank you to my patrons and channel members uh, for your continuing encouragement and kind comments on the channel. Uh, it's uh, I couldn't do uh, everything I do without you, so thank you very much indeed for that. If you're inclined to join up, then, uh, click the link above, I think, uh, or indeed the members thing below the video. Uh, although, to be honest, the patrons one is the way to go. It's, uh, it's easier for me to manage the patrons one. There's more stuff that happens. So go there rather than members if you if you want to make a choice. Anyway, thank you to you, you guys for sticking with me. Uh, very grateful for that. Um, uh, what else is there? I think that's it. So that's it for Parish Notices. Not much to say this week, but uh, yeah, keep watching, keep subscribing, keep hitting the like buttons and all that, and uh, look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been the Mr. Fly. Cheerio.